everybody, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella, my secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Coco, how are you doing tonight? I just really feel like I'm an entanglement with August. <laughs> an entanglement <laughs> with August. Entanglement with August. Yes. Um, yeah, but I really, I don't know, August and I just week we did it. <laughs> like the month? <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, when this comes out, this will still not be August, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah that's, honestly, I just live for that remix. <laughs> it was funny. I want to do it as, like, I want to do it as uh, a drag number, because apparently saying drag number made me trip over my words. Sorry, mm-hmm. I've been drinking tonight. It's like, it's whatever, it's fine. I have not. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I have not, so yeah. <laughs> Did she just come for me? <laughs> By the way, I forgot to ask Donna in the show game. <laughs> <laughs> so this is part two of our four-part miniseries. Yes, um, where we're gonna... a cat a cow no, 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 And dip. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about uh, queer media and, like, movies, TV shows, and, like... Um, other prints and other things that queer stuff happens in. Yeah, if you caught the first part <laughs> of our episode, we talked about mainstream movies. Um, yeah, it was pretty much all just mainstream movies. Yeah, and, mostly. Uh, and the first biopics. movies. Yeah, and the first movies that we ever saw, we talked about Miss Doubtfire. But yeah. seriously, I'm going to give you guys this little tidbit. So pause this recording right now. Go listen to the last episode. We'll be right here when you get back, okay? We'll mm. wait. Okay, I'm okay. Glad. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, picking up right where we left off. So you listened to the first episode. We you heard our thoughts on those movies and stuff like that. Um, and we're gonna continue on down the line. By the way, my mom sent me a movie. Um, and throughout the episode, I'll like research what it is. She's like, she's like, you guys need to watch this movie because my mom obviously was born in 1947 and so there's obviously was queer media that me and donna don't know about necessarily yes. and she was like oh yeah i should definitely watch this movie because like it like it had queer people in it and i was like oh okay cool so we'll figure it out well that's interesting to me because there's a lot of um older movies and even even current queer movies that i need to see and catch up on um one queer movie that i've always wanted to see it's from the year 1970 and it's uh boys in the band or the boys in the band Mm. um and it uh is basically one of like the quintessential like early queer films um it ends i think in all of them experiencing tragedy because that was kind of the narrative uh for gay life back then um yeah that's that's actually interesting the movie she said was uh, in 1971, so one year later. Oh. It was called Fortune in Men's Eyes. Huh. Um, she's like, I don't remember the details, but I do remember the character Queenie. Back then, all the gay community wanted to see was that movie. Huh. So, yeah, we'll look it up. We'll, we'll have to we'll check it out. We'll let know in a later episode. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, so what's Boys in the Band about? Um, It's... I think it's essentially about boys in the band. Uh, there, there, <laughs> there's some gay men that are, um, you know, artistically inclined, and it kind of talks about their different tragedies. I believe there is um, some themes of like suicide and self harm in it, mm-hmm. um, because back then that was kind of the narrative for um, queer people. I you also see like the trope of like flamboyant villains in cinema Ooh, yeah. as well. So, like, that's something that you see oh, like him up. from the Powerpuff Girls. Well, I mean, that sure. <laughs> Why not? Not necessarily, but... Um... <laughs> hey, Flynn Point villain. <laughs> <laughs> Definition. But, yeah, you, you also saw, like, r- like the, the villains. That, like, being gay was also aso- associated with villainy. Yeah, like, even, of... like, in Jumanji. Or, like, I know I just keep throwing out these random movie titles. These but, are like... a little more current than what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I, I feel like there were some Bond villains that were definitely, like, Well, yeah, because sexually... it's like, so it's, I'm thinking about that guy who had, like, the long mustache. He's like, Nyeh! Yeah, exactly. Like, you yeah. know, like, who's just super flamboyant. And, uh-huh. Oh, they was really associated. Because I never saw those characters as being queer per se Mm -hmm. but the definition of what they consider flamboyancy yeah donna's right yeah they definitely weren't ladies men no no none of them were they were always like they were usually alone Uh uh-huh um they were usually like by themselves they might have had an assistant but if they were that kind of character they were usually a guy yeah like and yeah oh gosh it's just mind blown okay that sucks yeah it, screw it was, you america for that crap so it was like <laughs> gays were either villains or they were all sad and wanted to kill themselves yeah yeah 
Or they made them Russian, like Boris and Natasha or something. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> this is where my semi-drunk mind goes to. Um, yeah, so I never saw Boys in the Band, but I yeah. want to. And I want to, I kind of want me and Donna to do an episode when we have watched the movies that we've wanted to see. Um, and then kind of give you guys dissecting like Dissecting it. Yeah, and like dissecting it a little bit. We also have, in a future episode, we want to do a true crime thing. Yeah, well. yeah, we love true crime. So yeah. that's something that we're going to be bringing you here in the near future because it's something we've been talking about for a while. That's going to be one that we have to, like, do our research and then come together and talk about our, our favorite true crime. Yeah. And we'll make it a queer true crime story yeah, for each definitely. of us. So, um, yeah, yeah, so... Uh, so I wanted to talk about, so we were talking about in this episode, we want to talk about some of those foreign films. And the thing is, so I don't know if Donna remembers Foreign this. films or indie films. Yeah, indie films. Or actually, they're just called, like, they're honestly alternative films. Yeah. The reason I say foreign films, and this is for our young listeners, mm-hmm. when you went to Blockbuster, because I know you all kind of remember what Blockbuster is, right? So if you wanted to watch any of the, like, TLA releasing movies or some of those queer films... No matter if they were made in the United States, they were always in the foreign films They were. Section. They were. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's why I keep calling them foreign films, even though they weren't foreign. They were... That's where they were. I would always go to the foreign section, and I would, like, peek at the gay movies while my... <laughs> <laughs> There was one I saw that had, like, the back of it, and there were, like, boys on jet skis, like, riding around together. I'm like, oh, I want to see this. Oh, yeah. yeah. And and we all have those young, just as a side note, we all had those queer experiences. Me and Don talked about this, like, offline once, Mm -hmm. where, like, when you were shopping with your mom and, like, underwear aisle. And, like, you're like, or, or, like, the Sears catalogs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, I know. Side note, side note. But that's why I keep calling them foreign films, because, like, when I was in college, um, I, cause like I went to college in, uh, roughly some year. Anyway, um, <laughs> so one of the movies I wanted to talk about. We were both was, in college in the 2000s. We were both in college in the 2000s. So there yeah. was a blockbuster in Grand Junction, Colorado that was next to my favorite restaurant. Um, and that's where I used to rent these queer movies from. So Latter Days, mm. Latter Days, the Mormon gay love story that we were all waiting for. Yes. You know, um, the missionary who falls in love with somebody who's talking to about the good word. And like, I just, the funny thing about Latter Days is even though it's not, it's not the best movie. It's yeah. not. Was it, that one of the TLA releasing movies? It was. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. almost certain it was. And if I'm wrong, people, leave me a comment and bash me. We need those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please. Please. Play Any Latter interaction Day. at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so, Latter Days, um, the story is about some a missionary who falls in love with a guy who's just kind of easy. That's all he is. He's just easy. Mm-hmm. He's an actor. Um, they get together, and then there's a scene with the worst acting I've ever seen in my life, um, where... The son is like, oh, yeah, like, eh, gay and whatever. And so the mom slaps him. They both cry in this really hysterical cry for about two seconds. It's awkward um, on screen. Um, And he gets sent away to, like, uh, make me straight camp. And obviously it doesn't work. And then they end up all happy and in love and whatever. I know I ruined the movie for you guys. But if you haven't seen Latter Days and you're (laughs) queer, like... Like, come on. I like how we talked about last time. We're like, we're not going to bring up any plot points. Coco's like, let me just give you like a a summary on the movie. (laughs) I know, because Latter Days Days was so like, here's also a thing, a T for you guys who are listening to this. So there was always um, the the missionary gay calendar that came out every year. Oh, yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, like, it was, like, such a big thing in our day growing up to where you could get that, like, missionary calendar with Uh all those, like... And they were supposedly, like, former missionaries who've come out of the closet and they're posing in the nude or whatever. That's hot. Yeah, it was. um, Definitely. (laughs) Um, So, like, that's why Latter Days was also so big because of that specific point. So... Yeah. I didn't mean to spend so much time on it, but, like... That was true. Like, Latter Days, even though, like, obviously super American, was also in that foreign section. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't super familiar with the TLA releasing videos, but the very first one, I believe, that I saw was Shelter, and that was 2007. So Latter Days was 2003. Shelter was 2007, and that was such a good gay love story. Oh, good. We watched it again, actually, recently. Yeah. Because... Because we did watch a bad one, which we'll talk about later, but, like, I wouldn't... Shelter was so eye-opening for me when I was younger, um, and I wanted to know if I still... 
felt the same way yeah later and me and donna both agreed right before we started like it is it's a good it's story. still just as good it's yeah it's so cute. the thing about these these movies so they had the whole like tla releasing was like basically this gay production company mm-hmm. that came out with like it was it's like pure flicks is now for christians what TLA releasing is for yeah, for gay yeah, people. That makes yeah. Sense. So, I mean, it was basically its own production company that released its own kind of uh, you know, genre of like queer cinema, queer movies. And uh yeah, Shelter was one of the very first ones that I saw. It definitely chronicles like a a good gay love story and um, a good gay love story. Yeah, it, it's it's one of it's a good like starter gay movie. It is a, honestly, yeah, I will say listeners, if you yeah. want to get into those some of those B slash C slash D queer movies, Shelter is a really good one. Like the acting isn't where you want it to be, mm-hmm. but like the story itself is pretty solid. The one thing I will say though that I noticed about myself when I was younger, I was attracted to the younger one in the movie, mm. and now being in my early thirties, um, the older one in the movie is more attractive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is so crazy. I kind of feel that. Yeah. yeah, actually, I relate. Yeah. Yeah. Watching it back, that that was kind of like what I felt at the end too. Yeah, and it's a it's a really great story, and so I think so. That's that's my biggest shout out for anybody out there. That would be the movie I would. There's many I want you to see, but like. Try that one. See how you feel about it, you know? So, the thing is, Shelter was one of the first, like, primarily gay movies that I ever saw. Hmm. But the very first, um, like, queer-centric movie that I ever saw was Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Hedwig. And I loved that movie. I I remember sneaking watching it when I was in high school. Another one of those on-demand movies that was on, like, Stars On Demand. And so Hedwig uh, talks about the story. It's it's actually um, a Broadway musical as well, um, written by John Cameron Mitchell. Was it? Did the Broadway musical come first, or did the movie? come The first? movie did. Really? I believe so. I actually, I, I it might have been off Broadway first. It might have been an off Broadway okay. play, then the movie, then then it was okay. on Broadway. I um I got I had the luxury, the pleasure of seeing Hedwig. Um, Maria took me. Shout out to Maria. Um, and it was so fantastic. It's really one of my favorite musicals. But basically what Hedwig does, it chronicles the story of Hedwig, who um, lives in war-torn um, East Berlin. And um, in order to have freedom in the U.S. and pursue uh, their dream of becoming a musician, um, undergoes a botched sex change operation, leaving Hedwig with a one-inch mound of flesh where they're genitals their genitals should be you used to be but yes. wasn't in the movie i thought it was like i did this because there was a character yes so she had to work in love with somebody who was like she had to with an american gi and that was how she got her citizenship right. is like in order uh her mom said to her in order to gain something you have to lose a part of yourself mm. and so like it's a really beautiful story the thing i love about hedwig is that it is so artistic and John Cameron Mitchell, we have another one of his films on this list that um, Coco and I actually watched together um, as well. But he is just a really, he's visionary. And um, there's themes of like Greek mythology in Hedwig, like Plato's Symposium. Like it talks about love. It talks about, um, you know, physical love. It talks about emotional love. It talks about self-love. And it, it's such it's such an important queer, like, movie and just like queer piece of art i really yeah. love it it's it's so good and mm-hmm. the music from it um uh because that's where wig in a box comes from, yes isn't it? wig yeah. in a box um yeah. origin of love origin um, of love which is funny because that's an actual true story yeah that's plato symposium yeah mm-hmm. and i just i think it's such a really great piece of queer media i know we have a lot of straight listeners who listen to our podcast uh tr- truly check out hedwig like the music from it is really solid mm-hmm. um it's a great piece of like really true queer media and i think that everybody would just really enjoy it um so but one thing i wanted to say too about hedwig in general is that it because i watched hedwig later in life like i somebody gave me the movie and whatever and so one thing i wanted to say about it was Go into it with just an open mind. It's yeah. it's a really interesting way of telling a story. Yes. Um, like so and I know we're not supposed to get into like the context of those media, but like just go in with an open mind and just, just enjoy the film in general. Yeah. yeah. So um That's great. One thing I wanted to say is, because I, I was going to say it earlier, but like, you know, it was like weird. But um, mm-hmm. so Donna, how are you doing this evening? Oh, you know, I'll, uh, 
I'll let you know after this brief commercial break. Get ready for the digital drag experience you've been waiting for. Introvert, an online interactive drag experience. The show is Saturday, August 1st at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with queens from franchise like Camp Wanakiki, RuPaul's Drag Race, and the Boulay Brothers Dragula. The show's hosted by Autumn Rains Hart and Camp Wanakiki Season 2 star Coco Gem Holiday. Tickets are available for $5 at thecdsdrag.com slash introvert. It's a podcast it with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Check it out. Tune into what they tell you podcast. Check it out. With Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Check it out. I am singing the national anthem into um, someone's uh, cavity while having a sexual experience. Because that's what happened in the movie. Short bus. Shit. Wasn't that, that a good... Really? Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I didn't remember that. <laughs> good heavens. Short bus. Donna turned me on to short bus. Um, also directed I, by John Cameron Mitchell. Yeah. And of I, Hedwig. <laughs> so, okay. I will say overall short bus is... I love the ending. I remember the yeah. ending the most. Yeah. Like, I just remember it just being this really, like, wholesome experience. Like, mm-hmm. they talk about open relationships and poly relationships in a way that I think is good. Healthy. Healthy. Yeah. Very not healthy. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, because it talks about the issues in the relationship basically beforehand and how that's not necessarily something that could be a band aid for a relationship, but it, it, it talks about like it, it takes away the stigma of a lot of poly relationships in, in Short Bus. It does. And it's also just a very sexually open and freeing movie. It's a very queer movie. Yeah. Um, it's one of those where multiple characters are chronicled kind of throughout it and then their lives all intersect at this sex party basically yeah definitely like I, it, it reminds me of the movie crash actually yeah 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 to where there's so many different powerful storylines mm-hmm. that are you're right intersecting and like they come together at this sex party and what's really interesting is like there's struggles mm-hmm. when it comes to because like like let's all be really real with each other here listeners like the fact is like sex is as much as we don't want it to play a big role in relationships, it often does. Yeah. Um, even if you wait to have sex, even if you have sex on the first date, it'll still play a huge role in your relationship. So this movie, talking about sexual awakening, queerness, transness, and, like, all this other stuff, and, like, sexual awakening and sex positivity, it was just really awesome to see. Yeah. Like, because these people had great relationships, but, like, there were problems in their sex lives. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And, like, that's just really cool to talk about. And the sex therapist who was supposed to be giving these people, like, advice was one of the people having those issues. Like, she couldn't experience an orgasm. Oh, okay. And, and, and then it gets to, like, the very end when, you know, it she experiences that and it's a beautiful experience for her. And, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, Isn't Margaret Cho in that? No. no. <laughs> no. What am I thinking? I don't know which movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, Jay Brannon is in it, and he is a singer songwriter who is uh, kind of an indie singer songwriter. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, it was it was a good movie. I I would like to rewatch Short Bus again. I would like to rewatch it again because apparently Margaret Cho is in it in my brain. <laughs> no. <laughs> no she's, she's 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 not. She's um, not. I don't I don't think she is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, that actually brings me to the movie that I've been wanting to talk about for a while is actually Boy Culture, mm. which actually talks about sex work oh, in yeah. a positive manner. Like the main character, so there's three main characters in the movie, and one of them is a um, is a sex worker. And mm-hmm. He's an escort, and it's like ca- kind of all about how he gets like paid a lot of money to have sex with people, and like because he's very attractive, and some people he just talks with, some people he sleeps with, whatever. Like, stuff like that. And then one of his roommates is somebody who's in love with him. The roommate is actually this black guy named uh, Daryl Stevens, who actually stars in Noah's Noah's Ark, Ark. Mm -hmm. which um, we'll be talking about when we talk about queer TV TV. shows. Yeah. Um, But yeah, this is one of the movies he starred in. And even even though the thing about this movie that makes me, like, want to bring it up and put it on this list is that... We know that queer people can be sex workers, but we don't talk about it in a way that's, like, not damaging. Like, normally it's like, oh, he had to turn to sex work because he's homeless, and, like, he's so ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. In this movie, he was very proud of it. Yeah. Like, I remember that about it. Yeah, and I I just... And, like, the thing is, I know a lot of escorts in my everyday life, and, like, 
the fact is it sex work really isn't about someone being so down on their luck that, that they have no other option. No other option. It's not some lame is like Yeah, seriously. <laughs> some lame is turn around. Sometimes it is. I, I'm not gonna diminish that. Sometimes yeah. it is. Um, because it's easy to get into, but sometimes I mean, it's like hell, like even strippers, for instance, like they make a F ton of money. Yeah. Um, and they're like, Oh yeah, I, I do this to like the story, like pay for college. Yeah. Because stripping probably could. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you ask a lot of these um strippers turn rappers they're like i love stripping i made so much money stripping (laughs) so you know i i you know i think that it's really good to end the stigma with sex work and i think a lot of queer movies do that because we are um you know a very sexual um based uh like group of people us us queers yeah because we have (laughs) like we talked about last time just just to reiterate this point like when we were talking about um the AIDS crisis like mm-hmm. the fact is like when you were telling gay men to wear condoms which put any kind of restriction on their sexual awakening their sexual liberty their like their sexual freedom mm-hmm. um was difficult and challenging because that's like one of the few things that they did have so in the queer community like sex is considered to be so much different than it is in the straight world kind of a good way se- uh, uh, kind of a good segue um from what we were just talking about uh, another really good foreign film that I liked, I, I believe it's a British film, is called Weekend. It was made in 2011. And this is one that I watched. It, it made me feel things. It was very emotional. It was very intimate. And it was all about a one-night stand turned into a weekend fling. So a one-night stand turned into something more than a one-night stand. Um, and it the whole movie takes place over an entire weekend. But it's about that like longing and connection that you feel with someone once you get past just the physical interaction with them. Fascinating. So it, it was something that I think, honestly, as gay men, a lot of the time, I, I feel like we can relate. Um, if you're not in it just for, like, the hookups, like, mm-hmm. a lot of the time these fleeting relationships can feel like, you know, like ships passing in the night. You know, like, it's it's some sort of experience, like, you were supposed to, you know, meet and have a connection with this person and... Yeah. A lot of times that doesn't happen. Exactly, actually, because in... Especially because you have to remember for, once again, listeners out there, when queer people come out of the closet or when they come out of the closet themselves, because it's usually before they tell anybody else, they recognize that right away that dating is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And so we do tend to have fleeting relationships or fast, hard and fast relationships that, like, burn so bright and then fizzle out of nowhere because, like, we're so happy that we're actually in a relationship with the gender that we identify with and it's just it's really eye-opening and so yeah. we can we can um because i've actually never seen it but the funny thing is so um if anyone somebody wants to write in the comments because i can't remember what the name of the film is right off the top of my head but there's another one it was about um right um right around prop eight time hmm. where there was this two guys who were staying at this like resort to get away from life and they started this relationship over this like weekend Hmm. Um, and they like, obviously like, obviously lots of sex or whatever. And they had lots of talking moments, like where they're learning each other and whatever. And it was just one of those hard and fast burns. If uh-huh. anybody remembers what that's called, please obviously write it in the comments. I love that because I think there is a lot of stories to be told in those little flings though. There is a lot of stories. There to be told is because I have emotionally connected with people in a short amount of time. And then never heard from them again <laughs> so many times. Yeah, and I do too, though. Like, I do. I <laughs> I had a lot of hard and fast relationships uh-huh. that felt like they were going somewhere. Yeah. But also, like, the connection just seemed so real. Yeah. Like, um, and, and, and it hurts, too, like, when it just doesn't work out and whatever. Mm-hmm. Or if they get into a long-term relationship, you're like, but I thought that we had something. And they're like, it was 24 hours. Like, yeah. Calm down, Nancy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. Oh my goodness. Um, another, okay, so if you want a funny twist on conversion therapy, uh, check out the 1999 film, But I'm a Cheerleader. It stars L- Natasha Leone, RuPaul Charles. Um, it's an excellent movie. It's, and Natasha's the one from Orange is the New Black? Yes, Orange is the New Black. Okay. She's Nikki from Orange is the New Black. And also she's in that show Russian Doll on yeah. Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, 
Um, I think it's Nikki is her name. Uh, I don't know. I think it's, it is. Yeah, probably. Clock uh, us in the comments. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a really funny take. It's a comedic take on basically gay conversion therapy. the The title of the movie literally is something that the title that that the character says, the main character says, when they're all accusing her of like being lesbian. She's like, "I'm not a lesbian. I'm a cheerleader." <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I remember watching the preview for that and that scene is so funny to me <laughs> but I'm a cheerleader <laughs> like god and it it plays so much into like typical like gender stereotypes so like yeah. RuPaul Charles is like the converted gay man that's teaching all like the the younger gays how mm-hmm. to be macho basically yeah yeah and and it's like like oh you gotta work on a car you gotta walk like this you gotta you know like all of that, and um, and then the girls are are basically doing home ec, and they're like trying to partner up the lesbians with the gay men, and obviously it doesn't work. Um, and it, like I said, it's a comedic take on a very serious thing, but um, it is such a good movie, so check it out. Yeah, I haven't seen it, and I want to. <laughs> um, actually, that brings me to the point of like funny movies that are not as enjoyable. Oh yeah, so like, many. I feel like this would be a great time to say this. So we watched E Cupid with one of our drag sisters recently, and like. E Cupid is one of the dumbest movies I've ever it's seen bad. in my gosh dang life. Morgan Fairchild makes a cameo in it randomly at the end as a waitress. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> understand how I don't even understand how I thought that because here's the thing though I was so like I was so in the closet and so watching these movies was like helpful because I was like <laughs> oh here's queer cinema this is so great like our whole topic yeah. the last two episodes and I was like this is great oh my god they're falling in love oh my god it's so pretty and perfect yeah and then just out of nowhere I'm just like oh watching it as now a guy who's married I'm because I'm married um my relationship is full of tons of love and I just who <laughs> that movie was so bad and the reason it's bad is because it's the epitome unrealistic. And I know we all talk yeah. about, like, movies, like, not being real. But, like, Shelter, for instance, which was made by the same production company, was fantastic. And I think yeah. it's, like, you could see that story happening with EQ, but it was just, like, so dumb that it this was. guy who was so in love with his partner or whatever was like, I just want to try something different. Because, like, it's, like, The whatever. plot just also just didn't make a whole lot of sense as well. <laughs> um also, some like another some other campy gay movies that I just don't like. Those um those not another gay oh movies. Oh my god, I was thinking They're about that. So bad. Ooh, it's supposed so to be a parody rough. on like teen movies, but gay. But they're just not funny. <laughs> like they're not. Yeah, and they they came up with another one, like not another not a gay movie. Whatever. Like there was yeah. a second one, and it was. I think there were probably around three. I think they were, and they're all terrible. All bad. All just atrocious and they cycle some of the same cast but then they like change the actors and they like are the same characters but different i don't know it's just terrible so bad and like i know that we're just like saying it's bad and like our listeners are like why is it bad here's the thing like the whole reason we came up with this idea is because like queer stories need to be told yeah and it's fine if you want to like make it funny or make it campy or make it silly or whatever like that but like those movies like are kind of I feel like they're made by straight people making fun of us to be honest like yeah it, it feels really awkward it feels disjointed it's not really comedic in the right not ways. a lot of substance no absolutely no susti- substance telling that I'm coming out of the closet story in like the weirdest way possible yeah and it just ugh, like it yeah. just across the board it was awful and of course I should say like a funny queer story like that was great but I can't think of one right off the hand right off the top of my head but like those movies are just so bad. They are. So very. They really are. <laughs> um, there's one, too, that I saw. I can't remember what year it came out, but it was on Netflix for a little bit. It was called Getting Go. And it's about this, like, guy who's creeping on this go-go dancer, and he wants to make a documentary on him. And then all of a sudden, he's, like, in, oh. he's in love with him, and then they, like, kind of have a thing. But, like, the go-go dancer is, like, unattainably attractive, so, of course, it doesn't work out. And mm-hmm. it just... Yeah. And also, the go-go dancer is one of the worst actors I've ever seen in any movie, ever! <laughs> I don't care how pretty he was. He was the worst actor ever! <laughs> Oh my gosh. You know, the funny thing is, as a side note, there are two movies that um, didn't hit our original list. By the way, we lost our list. We had to recreate it. We did. Um, There are two movies to which I didn't even talk to Don about, but I want to mention real quick here about the whole go-go boy scenario and good acting. So, uh, Bear City, 
is a really, 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 really good movie. Like, Bear City, Bear City and Where the Bears Are, like, both are just such great mini, like, movie series. Because they're movies. Like, I feel like I've seen Where the Bears Are bits and pieces of it yeah, while you're I was, watching I it. I was watching it so aggressively for you a while. You were. You were. It's very, it's very campy. I, <laughs> oh, um, it is. It's funny. It's really campy. It's very funny. campy from what I've seen of it. I haven't, I haven't seen them all the way through, though either of those it's just like so if you're gonna so those are actually good campy movies actually Mm -hmm. like they have such a huge following and bear city really does talk about the other side of queer and whatever and the right ways um and so like yeah like if you're don't watch not another gay movie watch bear city or watch where the bears are or watch girls will be girls because that's like one of the best campy drag movies ever i love Mm. girls will be girls as varla jean merman coco peru you know you can't go wrong Mm -hmm. with that Oh, is yeah. that the one with the drag queen and Coco Peru and then somebody else? Yeah, yeah. Oh, those, that's so funny. It's so good. <laughs> it's, it's so good, good There was actually. supposed to be a sequel that was in production but never got released. Oh, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that was super funny. It was I loved great. that. Yeah, and it was a drag-centric movie, so it was another drag movie that we could bring to your attention. So, um, we've talked about movies we disliked, we talked about movies we loved, we talked about foreign movies that were kind of on the ball, um, going through the ranks. Um, one of the other movies that were a little bit newer, not really, because it came out in 2009, was Shank. Now, Shank, on the other hand, was a very serious movie. It has, um, a queer rape scene in it, Mm -hmm. and I know that's a little bit of a trigger warning for some of you listeners out there, but here's the thing that's actually really interesting about having that in a movie is it makes it more normalized to also heteronormative movies as well. Yeah. Like, being afraid to tackle subjects um, in queer cinema is also damaging. Yeah. Like, so having that as a pinnacle point in that movie, and yes, there's other pinnacle points, of course, but having that storyline of, like, kind of, like, you know, gangstery, kind of, like, bad kids or whatever, going through life and whatever and discovering queerness... Like, was really cool to see, and it was a really beautiful story. Um, It ends so romantically, and I do suggest it to people. Because the fact is, like, any queer kid growing up today, even though the world is getting a little bit more accepting, there's still not a lot of our movies out there. Like, if they're just looking at Brokeback Mountain and Love, Simon... Yeah. Like... That's not the whole story. There's so many more. Yeah, there really is. And I... So that actually brings me to the last movie that I want to talk about, too. And that's Mysterious Skin. Mm. Um, That movie was made in 2004. It also has Joseph Gordon-Levitt in it, which he's also Mm. in Latter Days as well. (laughs) Um, Not a gay actor, but is in a lot of gay movies and plays a lot of gay characters. (laughs) Yep. Um, It tackles subjects like like escorting and Mm. also um, sexual abuse trauma. And how basically we interpret that over time. It's it, it's those subjects that are it, it is hard to watch at some points because it is um, really really touchy subject matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it, it's stories that are important and I think need to be told because it is a story that a lot of people go through. Um, a lot of queer people experience sexual abuse at an early age too. Um, not to say that that's like the typical narrative, but it's something that does happen. Right. Um, and uh, it basically talks about how these survivors of those instances kind of interpreted what happened. And um, mm-hmm. it's it's really important, really, um, like I said, it's not an easy watch, but it's something that um, it's a story and subject matter that deserves to, to have a platform because it is something that it mirrors our real life and, and what happens in the real world. Yeah, definitely. And so, kind of with that, um, the reason, like, another reason that this series is so important to us is because as we grew up, we, like, on Donna's side, having to hide quite a bit of, like, the queer cinema that, you know, she absorbed. Yeah. And then on my side, like, really struggling with my sexual orientation and, like, using my college years to, like, watch all these movies and to, like, try to find myself in these queer stories, it's really important that we have a really like really like uh, like a plethora of information yeah. that we're giving to queer youth or queer people in general cuz like even if you come out 40 and like at 40 like you're still going to be looking at queer cinema to like help you navigate this oh, so discussion many. because like I mean straight people have that in every sense of the media that yeah. they have. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's stories told everywhere. It's universal, you know, like you see you see 
like heterosexual um, storylines told all over the place, and there's no there's no shame in it. It's not something that's hidden. But nowadays, we're seeing more and more diverse queer storylines coming out. I mean, yes. we talked about Moonlight in the previous episode. Moonlight, we exactly. talked we talked about all the taboo subject matter that's covered in these independent mm-hmm. films that we really enjoy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that's something that in the future we want to see more of. We want to see yeah. more queer stories and diverse queer stories told Definitely. so then so then it mimics the actual people living these experiences exactly because i'm so i know it's important but i don't need a thousand more movies about somebody struggling to come out of the closet yeah like because even like moonlight and love simon and mm-hmm. broke back mountain like all of those stories are about struggling to come out of the closet and shelter then, even shelter even too yeah. like i just it, Latter Days, uh, Shank, yeah, uh, not boy culture, but like no. many of them on the list. And so, the f- the fact is, the other thing with that subject too is, now if you have the character who is queer and understands themselves, like it's so great to have femme and flamboyant characters. That's always a plus. Like we're gonna be talking about TV shows next, so like I'll just go ahead and bring up like obviously Will and Grace and things like that. Yeah, but I also don't need like somebody who's that queer identity. Like that is their whole character Mm -hmm. like the whole character is them being a flamboyant sassy gay yeah because flamboyant sassy gay is not a personality no it's not and although although that i mean that personality type or that characteristic is kind of like if you go to any gay club you can see it oh yeah you know like like, a hundred of them yeah, yeah but there i think that there's a lot there's many more facets to the gay community other than that one particular you know, Kurt Hummel and Jack um, mm-hmm. are are not the only like uh, representations of gay people that that we need to be seeing on on TV. You know, yeah, there's... I want the I want the middle road. I yeah. want I I don't want necessarily the stories of somebody coming in the closet. I don't need necessarily the Kurt Hummel. I want somebody who's right in the middle. And I want I'm, what I mean by right in the middle is not somebody like the whole storyline suddenly Dumbledore is gay. Yeah, I want I want this person to be gay. Sure, and like it like obviously when it comes to their dating choices or their ex boyfriends or something like that, like to just like have that as being part of their experiences, and then like the love story that's in every action movie, every romantic movie, every comedy. Yeah. There's always some subplot of a love story because we all need that as humans. Like, that that's the story. Yeah, yeah. That's the story there. That's what I want. And by saying that we don't want to see that character all the time, is we're not, like, femme-shaming by saying that. Not at all. Because, like, I want to see, like, femme characters that are a little bit more, like, you know, Daria-esque. You know, like, I would love that something like that. You know, like I want to see some femboys that don't have to be completely over the top, but also, you know, like are a little are a little bit subdued, but still have those feminine qualities and carry themselves with a confidence too. Yeah, you know, yeah, because like, it's 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 one of those things. And if it did come off, listeners, like I was fun shaming, I didn't mean it to. Because no. the fact is that those are the characters that Hollywood seems to book. Yeah, it's like you either have to be in that closet or. You're just a flamboyant person. Or you're a, person. you're a goddamn pride parade. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're a goddamn mm-hmm. pride parade. Yep. You see those flames from space. And, like, those characters are fine, but now I've seen too many of those as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, I we want, want middle ground. multifaceted gay characters. Queer characters. We want multifaceted queer characters and trans characters. And tr- Yes, yes. Good heavens. Like, Sense8 did a great job. Yes! Oh, Sense8 so was we'll, so good. So we'll talk about that in our Sense8 TV was so good. I love Sense8. Oh, um, that's, that's how you do trans characters. But the Wachowskis, <laughs> I think the Wachowskis often get it right, because um, the Wachowskis um, are really good at expressing queer identity, mm-hmm. because uh, a couple of them are trans. So, you know, that's something that... Um, is I, I think great when you have that representation even in the director's chair. Agreed. So, I fully yeah. fucking agree. So that brings us to the end of our episode. We don't have a feed the positive today because this is a four yes. part miniseries. We'll have some for you when we get to the fourth part. Yeah. Um but yeah, please make sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts. Rate us a five stars if you can, if you really love what the kind of content we're bringing you all. Yeah. And um tune in next week when we talk about queer television. Which I have so much I want to talk about. Oh, so much television. Oh, gosh. I actually, I think I was able to sneak television a little bit easier than I was able to sneak movies. Yeah, because it was just on the telly. Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, my name is Donatella, my secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of a Gem of a Secret podcast. The hosts of HM of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at The Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a J E M of a secret podcast.com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.